All right, welcome to our Lead Squared webinar today. I hope everyone is warm and ready to learn more about one of my favorite topics, honestly, how to drive growth. And, and I'm someone who loves to drive growth in any uh, way or shape or form. Uh, so that certainly excites me, but really getting down to the brass tacks of how that's done and key strategies around how to drive growth and testing and setting up a proper testing strategy, proper testing program, uh, it's certainly an exciting topic for me as a marketer, as someone who has worked for 20 plus years in higher education. Um, really an exciting topic. My name's Jason. Um, I am excited to introduce our guests today. They are from Level Agency, some of the smartest minds in the in the business, and really they're a you know, full service agency, and they can talk a little bit about what they do as we go through um are here to talk to us about testing their motto their 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 brand is really built around the idea of test learn grow and we want to talk to them more about that how they put that into action and most importantly how they're driving results from a testing strategy so uh patrick brad and jeff you guys want to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about level and what you guys do sure jeff you get us started yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Roebuck. I'm the Education Vertical Lead here at Level Agency, um, and our team is charged with spending every advertising dollar of our university clients as if it were our own, um, really testing, learning, and growing the businesses to get more butts and seats. That's what it's all about, uh, driving those leads, high-quality leads that are going to convert really effectively into applications enrollments and ultimately students so uh great to be here thanks for uh thanks for the conversation yeah, fun fact about jeff before he was head of our vertical uh education vertical he actually was in the trenches doing the media buying um mm -hmm. and and doing the hard work in the platforms and is also our subject matter expert internally on uh, paid search so very knowledgeable if you have any questions regarding uh specific uh you know media strategies jeff also led our media team for a for a period brad sure Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, I'm Brad Stevenson. I'm VP of Accounts with Level Agency. I've been with the agency for about four years. I've been in digital marketing for about 20 years. Spent about a decade of that directly in higher education, leading a digital marketing team for Carnegie Mellon University here in Pittsburgh. Um, background is primarily in creative. I was a, a, a theater major, um, spent time as a stand-up comedian and a journalist. Um, and then went into the analytical approaches with a degree, a master's degree from CMU. So I'm really passionate about how we take uh, creative and storytelling um, and we apply analytical methods to determine if, uh, if that messaging is working as we expect it to. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later today, I know. So Brad, we are, break we are breaking news here, friend. And one of the things we do want to talk about later is a concept that's fascinating to me, fundamentally talking about creative pursuits and the balance between an analytical approach. Yep. You're a stand-up comedian, so I think we're going to do 45 minutes of stand-up here. Um, yeah, I have, it, I have a tight a little, 20, Jason, worked out. A little, so. a little Pittsburgh, <laughs> uh, a little higher ed, a little uh, marketing platform. Uh, no, I'm kidding. But that's really cool. But to, to your point, um, that balance between the creative and the analytical is 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 really everything, uh, not only in testing but in marketing at large. So excited to learn more about that. Pat, yeah, uh, hey everyone, Patrick Patterson, managing partner and president here. Um, my background uh, went went to school a long time ago for math and computer science, and as I like to say, I went to the dark side that is marketing um, about 17 years ago uh, and worked on the client side. For, for five years in the education uh, space and uh, managed three online brands. Their digital advertising spend around $43 million a year. Um, I just say that to, to say that I, uh, I made $43 million worth of mistakes and uh, able to learn from them and grow from those uh, over that time. You know, 2010, we started Level um, when we saw an opportunity to kind of build the, the digital advertising agency that we thought we needed when we were on the client side. So, uh, you know, that was one rooted in ROI and rooted in, um, you know, really uh, access to data and data driven decisions. And so we, we started there, there in 2010, predominantly in the education space. We've been doing it ever since. Um, you know, now we're one of the premier 
uh, education uh, agencies in the, in the country. We also service B2B and e-com. I think that's really important to, to mention that we're, we have multiple verticals because uh, one of our uh, network of benefits, I think, is that we're able to pull those tests and those learnings from other verticals and uh, use that to form hypotheses for education as well and vice versa. So, um, you know, we, we work with some of the largest, uh, some of the largest uh, systems in the education space today. Um, and yeah, Jason, really excited to, to be here. Thanks for the, the warm introduction and excited to talk about my, my, my passion, testing, learning, growing, being the, being the marketing scientists, not the marketing gurus, right? Being the, 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 the getting down in the dirty and, uh, and testing it. So appreciate it. it, man. So, yeah, absolutely. So as we talk about testing, let's set the backdrop. Talk to us. You've been an agency for 10, 11 years. To your point, you've got multiple verticals in flight, but you've been anchored in, in education to some extent. How have you seen the space evolve? How has your work evolved over the last 11 years? What are you working on now that you didn't used to? What's since fallen by the wayside? Just kind of talk us through that that decade of evolution, and then uh, take us up to today, and we'll start talking about some testing strategy. Yeah, so when I, you know when I entered the space in around two thousand five ish, I started looking at uh, you know cost per enrollment, cost per student, cost per you know sorry building reports. And back in two thousand five, that was like inventing fire uh, for marketing, right? Uh, that was that was a crazy that was a crazy idea, uh, you know, because everyone was still in CPM and CPC world. Uh, so, uh, you know, in 2010, 2000, that, around there, um, you know, it was really about uh, mar- uh, media mix modeling, looking at all the platforms together and really understanding how they work together um, and optimizing each channel effectively and doing it really well. It was really complex. You know, Google was complex. Facebook was complex. Um, so the 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 being at really good in the platforms was enough to do good work in 2010 to, to through 2015. Um, now what we're seeing, it's not about being great at the platforms. Uh, you know, that is, you know, if you're, if your advertising agency isn't great in a, in a platform, they shouldn't be in advertising period that that's commoditized. Right. And I think ROI in general, talking about CPE, and uh, see, you know, cost per application, and really managing and optimize towards that. That should be table stakes, right? Right. So what what we're seeing today is the rapid change of growth and the rapid change of change, really, in the in, in what's happening. The the tools that have been produced over the past two years mean we're spending less time pulling levers and pushing buttons in the platforms. Um, which I bet Jeff, uh, who, who used to do that job, uh, wishes he had back 10 years ago. Uh, but now we are more, we are trying to figure out what's the next thing, right? And I, I, what I say and what I say to the, to the company is our biggest competitor is not the other agencies. It's us a month ago and us a year ago. We're competing against these crazy changes and we need to do better and better. The, the world where you can do the same marketing and forget about it, if we did that, we would be fired. So we're constantly looking for what is the next thing. And a lot of this was driven by COVID, right? When uh, in 2000, you know, 2021 and 2020, we saw just everyone, every, you know, trade shows shut down and in-person shut down, everything shut down. So where did everyone go? Digital. And so, and then everyone got digital savvy overnight. Uh, and including the consumers and how they wanted to be talked to and how they wanted to be addressed. So we had to adapt and we had to adapt quickly. And I truly, you know, I believe the agencies and the, and the, the schools and the marketers that adopt this, this idea that your, your unit of progress is no longer a, how many campaigns you built. It's how many tests you did that day, that week, that month. You know, a manufacturer can look at how many products they produce. We as marketers should be looking at how many tests we produce. And that should be our, uh, you know, how we measure success going forward. You know, I love that. So let's jump right in. Talk to me guys about just how you define a solid testing program. What are the building blocks? Build it, build it for us conceptually ground up. What does a testing program look like in the level world? Yeah, I mean, it really starts with what Patrick is talking about, making sure the table stakes are there. So first, you have to make sure, am I doing all of the best practices that I need to do? And am I I exploiting what I know needs to be exploited? 
And then you start talking about, okay, how do we explore, right? How do we test this sort of idea of exploitation versus exploration, right? Maximize what we know works and then start testing some of those assumptions and start building off of that, right? So you need to have curious mindset, you need to have respectful discourse. You can't have any ego about what exists today. You absolutely cannot say, we're gonna keep running this landing page creative because I built it five years ago and everybody absolutely loves it, right? You need to make sure that you have the building blocks of a culture of testing, looking at data to make those decisions as well, right? So you need to make sure that, okay, how am I using data to tie the success of what I'm, what I, my hypothesis and how am I tying that to the bottom line? What is my bottom line in education? Of course, it's cost per enrollment, cost per applicant, et cetera, right? So how does this tie to my bottom line? And it makes the decision-making process so much easier, right? It's yes, we can go with your favorite, I love the color blue ad, um, but it's gonna cost you three students down the line in this month if we don't go with the green ad, right? Uh, and then it, the, the amount of clarity that data provides when you're relying on those uh, uh, on the results uh, can be really really empowering. Yeah, yeah, I think I think Jeff, you know, said you know the ego thing is really important. It used to be the highest paid person in the room, right? Their opinion. That's what we did. Uh, and nothing, you know, this is this is consumer centric feedback that we're getting. And so listening to our consumers, how they want to be talked to, how they want to be uh, reached. That's really, really important. But the, the, that starts and, you know, whether you're on the client side or the agency side and you're listening here today, that starts with expectation setting up front, right? Yeah. So a solid testing program starts with me telling you, hey, Jason, we're going to be testing, right? And some of this stuff isn't going to work. And failure is okay as long as we're doing it fast and we're learning from it. Um, and we're, we, you know, we don't want to be two and oh, we want to be 37 and 12 in our ideas. And, and, and that, that expectation setting from the front to me, if, if you don't do that, you'll, 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 you'll never execute a, a solid plan. Yeah. So in terms of expectations, that's a, that's a really good point and a call out, you know, and some folks might even advocate for setting aside, you know, por certain portion of the spend, right? 10% or 15 or I've even seen some places where they'll budget for a test and they'll almost anticipate potential, right? Just to hedge risk or potential uh, impact to performance. Uh, how do you guys think about that on the analytical side? Do you, do you actually bake in expectations around a test in terms of spend or performance that, that could go the other way to help set those expectations or does it really depend on the client? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, Jeff talked about, what he's mentioning is the multi arm bandit approach, which is exploitation exploration framework, right? Um, I am a sucker for Pareto's principle, the 80 20 rule. Uh, so, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, we try to think about 80% uh, exploitation, 20% uh, exploration, right? So 20% of that budget really being testing those ideas and coming, coming out with, uh, with new things and innovating. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we land on 10%, uh, but, uh, setting that up front and saying, Hey, a portion, it doesn't need to be 20. It doesn't need to be five. It needs to be a portion that is dedicated to different outcomes. Right. And the outcome being learning, not cost per enrollment or students, uh, because you know, the long tail of those tests, we're going to do all these tests. It's going to be this one that wins. And then we're going to exploit the crap out of that. And we're going to we're gonna get 20 times the return on this idea over here. Um, and so you gotta test all of these um, to, to really find that. And so again, setting that expectation differently of saying, hey, the outcome here is learning. The outcome here isn't ROI specifically. It will lead to ROI uh, if we can exploit it later. Yeah, no, that's really good. And again, expectations. And you mentioned earlier, um, you know, the smartest person in the room. I mean, the reality is there's there's still that culture in places on certain teams, if not from a decision making, you know, the 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 most senior person in the room will certainly add a level of skepticism or optimism or bias into the equation. So talk to me about stakeholder management. Uh, and again, even those of us who are working internally, right, we're still managing internal stakeholders. You've got somebody who's maybe not as oriented to the culture of testing um, and they've got a decision. They've got a way they're leaning. 
Uh, I understand expectation setting, but it's really also about buy-in and honestly just selling somebody on that approach. How do you guys go about that? Well, a, a couple of things. Uh, number one is setting the expectations from the beginning of a relationship is incredibly important. You don't want to come in, um, you know, over-promising and talking about, you know, having a playbook that's going to lead to this and that. You know, if we start with a, our approach is testing and we have the same expectations of our partners, uh, then you have a better beginning of that relationship. The other thing that we we talk about, radical candor is one of our values and the, the idea of leaving the ego at the door. One of the things we train around here with the agency and that we try to continually work with our partners in is this idea of approaching everything as if you might be wrong, right? And so it's, again, it's that ego check situation. And we work very hard through all of our conversations and relationship building um, to not only establish ourselves and the way that we work in that way, but we also continually work to set those expectations with our partners. And, and so it really does, sometimes it comes down to challenging conversations, right? That, that we are able to have because of the development of those relationships from the beginning um, of a particular partnership. Yeah, let's say no, another, I another quick piece to that is always finding the common ground or what is the source of truth? What is the thing yeah. your stakeholder cares about? Uh, we've had, many a time an executive level conversation of we've convinced all of our main marketing contacts. Now we've got to convince the president um, that this is the right approach and it's a radically different strategic approach. So our first question is, well, what metric do you believe in? What metric do you care about? And let's find a way to tie our ideas directly to that measurement so we can all be on the same page and say, this is the explanation for the strategy. And this is our hypothesis for the outcome of that strategy. So for especially for those really big life-changing uh, um, strategies that we will hypothesize against and get MVPs out and proofs of concept and some amount of data and proof points behind it, aside from research. It's really about finding that, what does this person care about? Um, and let's make sure that we're aligning um, our expected results to the things that they care about. No, I appreciate that. Uh, you guys have mentioned, uh a couple of almost cultural elements around radical candor and some things. I don't want to talk about that. And incidentally, I want to invite everyone um, who's joined us and thank you for spending some time and sharing some ideas uh, with us, invite you to drop some questions in the chat. One of the fun aspects of this for me um, in hosting this with our friends at lead squared, my friends at lead squared and with our friends at level is you've got two organizations that love to put out what is in my humble opinion, fantastic content. Uh, so I invite you to encourage you to subscribe to the Lead Squared YouTube page where this will be housed. Great blog articles on the Lead Squared website. But uh, Level also puts out a great uh, podcast, one of my favorites. Wherever you get your podcasts, check out the Test, Learn, Grow podcast from our friends at Level. That's all a way of saying is you check out that podcast. And as I listen to the podcast, it's clear, uh, Pat and Brad and Jeff, you guys have built just a culture, a rock solid culture. And in knowing you guys, culture around testing. Uh, and that takes a long time, right? And this really goes beyond testing. Anytime you're trying to build a culture that takes just rigor and discipline and investment in certain principles and concepts, how have you guys built a culture of testing in your agency? Obviously, that gets to hiring, firing, promoting, coaching, branding, how you speak externally. How, how have you built that over the years around this concept of testing for growth with your clients? Yeah, so... First, you know, if you're if you're going to ignite any change in an organization, um, you need to do exactly what Jeff said and start with the why. Uh, why are we doing it? Uh, and um, you know, I think we have a a really good why that's tied to our focus and our uh, of performance marketing. You know, testing gets us better results and makes happier clients and all of those things, right? Um, so that's easy. Uh, the hard part is then. Um, institutionalizing that as kind of a core value in the organization. To me, you know, culture is a series of habits that everyone has every single day and the way they work with each other, the way they uh, talk to clients. Um, so when we, whenever we try to address a cultural issue as an organization, it's about addressing those habits and changing those habits. First, it's identifying those habits and saying, you know, what are we, what are we doing every single day and every single minute that's leading to us not having this? So with testing, um, 
you know, it's, it was really about at the beginning. And this is Jeff, Jeff probably remembers at the beginning, we would pull up all of our campaigns and we would say, which ones are we not running a B tests on? Right. Like, and then it would, it would be the next three weeks where it's like, all right, each one of these needs. To, and so it's just like, that was simple. Um, now a B test, every, we're doing a B test across the board. Now it's how valuable are those tests, right? So now we have a hypothesis intake form as an organization that when you come up with an idea, you put it in, it's documented, we follow up on it. So again, it's about, you know, whenever changing culture, and I can talk a long time about organizational design principles around that. But, you know, to me, it's about figuring out what those habits are that will drive success and they have to be daily. They have to be reinforced. And then, you know, at a, at a macro sense, we have to lead by example as leaders, right? As managers, as, as marketers in the space, um, we practice what we preach every single day, you know, and even internal projects that we have here, we take a test, learn, grow approach to them, yeah. you know, as anything, it, it could be the smallest thing. We, we test it. Right. And I think that is really important. If if we just said this, it's like having an open door policy and then never being available for a meeting. Right. Um, you know, if we just said we were a testing organization and didn't even test like we test internal team structures and pricing structures and everything and learn from that and figure out what's best for us and our partners along the way. Yeah, we even tested our office space choices uh, after the pandemic. Right. Like what, what are we going to be doing after this? What does that look like? We build a cultural roadmap, um, which I think is really important that that highlights the social and organizational things that we want to do. But the the foundation of that was test, learn, grow our values and our diversity, equity and inclusivity um, council and practices. And so those were not things that were part of that. Those were foundational. And we made sure that what that meant is anything we did as part of, you know, whether that be social activities, happy hours, anything it all had sort of those elements of the test learn growth philosophy associated with. We also make sure that, you know, from, from the top down and the bottom up approach it is all about culturalizing the idea that we should be testing, we should be learning and we should be sharing those lessons and those learnings and those tests. Right. So ever we have all company meetings where regularly we have uh, different people reporting on things that they tested from a media capacity, from a team structure capacity. During my team meetings, I literally ask uh, two questions. I ask, uh, what good prop uh, do you want to give somebody else on the team? And what's one mistake you made that you learned from this week that other people can learn from? So it's really popularizing the idea that you are expected to screw up and be wrong on occasion, right? Um, but it's it's all about what Patrick said is learning fast um, and, and pivoting quickly and sharing that knowledge with the rest of the team. So everybody sees at every level of the organization, um, we, are, we are a learning and growth mindset team. No, I appreciate that. It definitely takes a certain level of, of humility, Jeff, as you mentioned. Let's get to tools. And we've got a great question in the chat around um, the question is, how do you keep track of all this testing and make sure it's all tracking together towards positive ROI? So uh, you guys take that in whatever direction. But I think, you know, just from a tactical standpoint, as we talk about the goal is as many tests as we can realistically run, you know, are there specific platforms you use, specific methodologies you use? Kind of talk me through tactically how you track all of that. Yeah. Brad or Jeff, you want to take that? I'm happy to start us off. Um, right. So we use Asana as a, as a project tool, but we have adapted that uh, to help us with our testing roadmaps, right? So we have, um, you know, for each of our partners, we have what tests are currently running. We have our hypotheses in place for that. We have relevant data in, in the descriptions for those. Uh, we have timelines associated with those. So there are milestone dates for when people need to be checking in on the data and the progress toward those goals to get to an answer and a statistically significant answer or as statistically significant as we can with a particular test. Um, and, you know, anything that is associated with that. So if there's creative associated with that, we, we drop that in. So we have adapted a project management tool. Um, Asana is pretty flexible. Uh, but we would just simply adapted a project management tool and turned it into a testing roadmap opportunity. We also use Miro, which is a collaborative tool. And we have been doing more and more uh, Miro online whiteboarding type of testing where we put our 
you know, we have the brief for what we're going to be testing. We have our hypothesis. We have our audience definitions and things like that. And we can build out roadmaps visually uh, for that as well. But it's really, it just comes down to whatever tool you're using, making sure you have the appropriate hypothesis tracked. You have documentation around the data that you need to capture in advance so that you know that at the end of the test, hey, we will know we have been successful because X, Y, Z, and we have the data here to set that up successfully. And then you have your milestones to make sure you're tracking and checking in on that based on the timeline you set up for that particular test. Yeah. Is there ever, is there ahead, ever an instance? Well, I was just gonna ask, you brought up Miro, and you know, I'll use Miro to bring in you know, user research, and as you mentioned, develop hypotheses. Is there ever an instance where, you know, you mentioned, for example, you know, you're testing the color of blue on an ad, and you know, clearly just an example, but how do you guys quantify the amount of research you need to do so you know what you're testing? Is there a platform or approach that's kind of almost pre-hypothesis in that regard? So you know you got it right, you know what you're testing for, or is that really where you're you're using your intuition? Probably a blend of both, depends on the project. How are you guys thinking about that? It's, yeah, we use it, we use design thinking uh, in in the in the the test phase, right? So the the design thinking is a is a place where you're you're looking, and I I, I think you know our I, I think uh, our partner Pat says this better than I do, so I'll probably butcher it. But um, you know, we we look at um, first the data, right? What is the data telling us, right? The historical data. Um, then we listen to our customers and their needs. So there might be, there might be something that we're missing um, based on what they're seeing, boots on the ground, uh, or their needs, right? Um, and then we're listening to our gut. Uh, you know, right. and, and gut is data, right? I, I, t I train that on day one to every employee that comes in here, your gut is data. So those are the three things we're doing. And it starts with you know, data -driven, a data-driven approach, being very empathetic, and then having a culture of psychological safety where you can trust your gut and and test it and have a world where failure is okay, right? So all three of those things need to be true. So we bring it all together to inform whether that or not that hypothesis, but we don't always have to get the hypothesis right, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is fail fast, right? We're in digital, so uh, we could change it in an hour if we needed to and making sure that we're giving, our, giving ourselves the room to make the minimum viable marketing, uh, the minimum viable hypothesis here uh, to to really get into market quickly and learn from it. it. It highlights the importance of that tracking, like keeping track of all the tests you're doing is really important because you want to build off of them, right? You want you want to build a foundation and go up instead of just a shotgun approach, spaghetti on the wall approach of I have this random idea, maybe blue will work. Um, you want to make sure that you're tracking all of historic tests, you can build off of them, and you're being honest with yourself about hypotheses. It would be so easy to have dozens of tests running at any point, and I learned that green beat out blue, um, and even though two months ago I thought blue would actually beat it out, I changed my hypothesis for the benefit of looking good in front of a client, right? Um, but you're not going to learn anything. Um, if you're not building off of those very valid assumptions that you had, you know, two months ago when you first started the test. So it's, uh, again, it's really important to have that tracking, that accountability and that honesty and that safety to say, I was wrong here. And I think I know why let's build or test why I think uh, I was wrong in this instance. Right. Write it down, have a date when you're going to check on it again. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. If we're going to boil it down to, to any like yeah. truly yeah. tactical. And Jason, uh, Jeff makes a really good point about, uh, you know, I have been with organizations that have been like, well, we just just we just have to pick a subject line test for that. And you're not you're not getting you're not getting to growth with that. Right. You're not asking right. those key questions. And so when we set out to create a hypothesis, um, you want to make sure it's provable, it's relevant, it's measurable. You want to ask, you know, what don't I know about my audience? It's going to be important to know in the future. And so, again, this this may be driven by a combination of you know, the, your, your partner, your client who knows the business so well, it might be driven by some of their gut about like, this is what we really, this is what we believe, right? And then we have our data that we pair with that to say, this is what the media team is seeing every single day. These are the insights. And you use that to come up with these sets of questions, these larger questions about your audience. And then every test that you run should support the answers to those questions. So they shouldn't just be little micro tests. Sometimes you do have that, right? Sometimes you just have a little mini thing where it's like, Hey, we, we really want to make sure we have the right CTA in place for this, this particular audience. 
But in general, um, you want to um, try to ladder your tests up to some larger key questions that you're working through with your with your partners. Yeah, and I appreciate you calling out growth. Um, and I think it's a really important distinction if we can get a bit philosophical after the tactical talk about marketing and the state of marketing today. You know, Lead Squared as a platform uh, powers growth for, for institutions. You guys put it clearly out in front as part of your brand growth. There's a keen difference between growth and optimization. And in my opinion, you know, a lot of marketers today are really focused on optimization, which does not actually by definition necessarily equal growth, right? Just because I get better at doing something, the trend line may still be down and to the right. I think a lot of that gets back to even what we're testing for. You guys have talked about the concept of a hypothesis several times. You know, what you select to test ultimately is going to determine the results that you get and whether or not that's driving growth or just incrementalism or, you know, uh, optimization. So how do you develop this hypothesis? I know how you mentioned earlier, even a hypothesis intake form, like talk us through like what deserves to be tested. What's the process you guys have established for that? And what's the expectations on your team when they're bringing those ideas in? What do they need to be bringing that, that would be worthy of a test in that sense? Yeah. So, you know, the, we have, we have two tools that help us uh, start this one. Uh, we do a pro forma where we go backwards from your end goal and go upwards and, and, and look at the different uh, points along the way, the, you know, conversion rates that uh, click to lead, lead to app, app to enrollment, right? So we're gonna go all the way up funnel. We're gonna get that picture. That It's really important. If you haven't done that yet, it's probably like the first step, right? Like, uh, let, let's let's get that taken care of. Then we say, we, we, we do some design thinking exercises using Miro or it could be anything else, whiteboard doesn't matter around, you know, okay, what would have to be true for us to hit the goals that they see, that they want, right? What would have to be true? And, and, and to me, making a great strategy is determining what would have to be true and then tackle, tackling those, those, big, those big items, right? So that right there, if I say if I said to you what would have to be true for you to hit your lead goals, you're not going to say, well, all our ads would be green and not blue, right? Like that 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 right there automatically takes out some of the small that small stuff. Then what we do is we brainstorm that, and brainstorm has good ideas and bad ideas in it, and we use the Eisenhower matrix, the impact and effort matrix, where we're identifying those gold mine those those gold mines, those quick wins, um, and we're trying to really uh, work our way through. Um, you know, the things that take the least amount of work that are going to have the greatest amount of impact. Right. And so to, to us, those tools, that's, that's how we prioritize and how we come up with those big things. Then from there, it's saying these, these are the, these are the big things that we're going to need to drive forward. These are the major strategic initiatives that we're going to do. And again, for those, then you break that down. You kind of do the, a mini version of what I just talked about for that. What would have to be true for this to be true and you start in and then those are the things that go into the hypothesis uh the hy uh, hypotheses intake form right so it's having that strategic plan and typically a year or where those big ideas come from then we break it down to quarters then we break it down to weeks and we break it down to days and that's where the habits go in so it's it's really tying it all together from that initial what would have to be true for us to hit those outcomes in that performa uh and developing the strategy from there and then we then we gut check the hypotheses by saying, is it provable? Can I prove it? Is it relevant to those overall goals? And what am I going to need to measure this? And if you can't answer those three questions about your hypothesis, you need to go back to the drawing board and do some work. So that make sure that you have a way to prove it out. I appreciate that. One of the especially for folks who are new or maybe do a testing program or more junior in their careers. Let's say the test does it comes back not statistically significant, or you know, there's not a material answer either way. Um, what do you do? What, how do you guys handle that? How do you approach it? You know, the, the, no statistical significance. You've designed the program. You got a great hypothesis. You think it could drive growth one direction or another. But you know, do you run it again? Do you tweak some things? Do you talk it through? I mean, I think you really take a hard look at uh, you know the end goal. What I what was I trying to do? Um, and did, were our assumptions faulty for some reason, or was I just plain wrong? Was the metric I was using the wrong metric? Um, you know, there, there are a lot of like nitty gritty details into how am I testing this? 
um, and how, uh, what were the results? So in, in a situation where it's a push, it's you were right and you were wrong, like there was no real impact, then you just sort of say, well, which, which one makes most sense for the business? Uh, does the color blue align better with the brand and then the color green, then let's just go with the color blue, right? Um, but really it's about understanding your assumptions and saying, are my assumptions wrong or is there a different way to test my assumptions? So if it, blue green, just because we're stuck on that test idea, uh, maybe I tested in Facebook and it, it it was a push blue and green, or maybe blue went out when I thought green would went out. And my hypothesis might be, well, maybe blue was just a better brand alignment with Facebook's blue. So is there another channel that I can test this blue green idea? Maybe I do it in a display channel. So it's the same hypothesis. You're just executing against that hypothesis in a different way. And that's a little bit of a different approach than saying, was I just flat out wrong? And we need to right. move on to build off of that or change to a new idea. I've seen a you know, we, we run thousands of tests a year. Right. And you know, the, the, I have seen, uh, you know, people just starting out run a test and then they wait for that statistical significance. Right. They, they wait until it gets, hits 95 and 99. And I, I, I say that because I've seen Jeff do that. Right. This yeah, is I was going to say, is, you're talking about me uh, right now. And, <laughs> and, <years> <laughs> and I've done it, uh, because, you know, we're, we're mathematicians, we're scientists, we're waiting, statistics, statisticians, we're waiting for that. That's why it's really important to pick a date in the future where you're going to look at it yeah. and make a decision because it's possible and more, more than likely that you picked something that doesn't have an impact and you've run it, you've run it through its course. It didn't have an impact. It's not statistically significant. Cut bait, find something that, that has bigger, a, a bigger impact. And, um, you know, that might mean pivoting, that might mean just killing it and saying it was a bad idea. Doesn't matter what we do here. Uh, that's what we learned and that's good. Uh, so set that date at near term date in the future. And we call them pivot or persevere moments, right? So we, we say, yeah. you know, we pick a date in the future. We set a meeting. We say, we're going to talk about it. We're going to look at it. And then in your mind, Pat, and again, I know it varies by by what we're testing for, but let's say you do get something statistically significant. You test it again in a year, three months, two years, forget about it. Like, What's your routine cadence in terms of like, you know, st significant pieces that you're testing? How often do you revisit that? Annually, I think, is the is the easy answer there. Uh, sometimes more often, sometimes longer. Uh, we... One of the biggest question marks we had in, in when we started the agency was, and everyone did in 2010, 2012, 2015, you know, was the this idea of the the Google optimization uh, algorithm versus uh, real media buyers, right? And you right. would you would, and so we actually did the John Henry test every year. We would have people against machines every single year. We did it every year for eight years. The the people won. For nine, you know, the ninth ninth year it was getting closer. Tenth year it was getting even closer. Eleventh year it was even. And guess what? In year twelve, here we are, and the algorithms are finally there. And if we had stopped five years ago and said no, humans are better than this Google makes money button that that they created, uh, then uh, we would never be where we are today with the results that we're seeing today. So some of those really big concepts. Again, check your ego at the door and say, let's revisit that. And there might be things that you just need to retest every single year if your gut is saying, hey, this is what's going on. But also look at the look at the other players in the industry. You know, if if some of the bigger players are are doing it and you're not, there might be a reason for that. I see this a lot with specifically Facebook, where people tell me Facebook doesn't work. And we go into the platform and we look at it. It's like, of course, it doesn't work the way you have it set up. You're not, you're not running it right. And it's not that Facebook doesn't work. It's that maybe you didn't design the test right or you didn't set it up right. And so you got to challenge those those historical institutional piece, foundational pieces of knowledge that you have. I would say annually. Yeah. No, this is some great great examples between Facebook and Google. And to your point. We can all point to lots of folks that have had a tremendous amount of success on those platforms with different strategies and a lot of folks that have, have not. And 
often the, the the differences in just the execution of testing your way into success. So it was a really, and I love the date idea, just write it down, nail it to the wall, hold yourself accountable. Uh, you know, a lot of testing and a lot of it's mindset and a lot of it's just your ability to be humble, as we've mentioned a couple of times, and then hold yourself accountable. We're all humans. We all have bias. We all have things we think we'll see, but that accountability to, and the discipline really, to uh, hewing to your program is, uh, as you said, over five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years till you get payoff is is often the difference between success and failure in a sustainable business. Talk to me about some other, you know, of your favorite variables to test, and you know, let's bucket into like two or three, you know, just bread and butter, you know, in an educational marketing context, we're, we're always running these versions of of a test against these variables, and then maybe one or two that folks may not have run in a while or may have forgotten about, or a few a few stones that we could turn over and they may learn something new uh, from a test they hadn't thought of previously. So not sure who wants to take that, but just, you know, some of your favorite variables, favorite tests to run. Uh, Pat stole probably one of my favorite, which is manual versus automation uh, and all of the platforms. That's the biggest one. And that generally has a huge impact. So that that's another relatively low effort and high impact uh, test. Um, some other things we always consider creative uh, when we're, we're testing these things. So um, calls to action are, are pretty pretty much one of the first steps we consider, especially compared to the audience. So uh, appropriate audience segmentation um, and your messaging strategy, your imagery strategy, making sure we're testing best practice ad formats. Um, so for example, some clients may only be running one image in Facebook uh, and that's it. And they might be testing that image, but the only thing they have running is an, a static image. So testing carousel, animation, video, um, those sorts okay. of things. Landing page testing, the easy stuff in landing page testing can have a huge impact. So like swapping out the hero image is super duper fast and quick and can have a huge swing on, on your conversion rates. Um, and then taking a look at some of the things that you can test to impact your conversion rates from lead to enrollment conversion rates. So can I test marketing to those people in display or Facebook to encourage them to go even lower in the funnel. That stuff is super cheap to run from a media spend perspective. Um, and even a 10% lift in your conversion rate, given the volume of leads that majority of education institutions are running is going to have a huge impact on your bottom line. So the, probably some of my favorites are around the easy, quick win things uh, that can make a really huge impact on your funnel. Yeah, yeah, two of my favorite. Oh, I was just gonna say two of my favorites. Uh, we did a we did a really cool holdout uh, holdout test to answer um, a question there, but it was a it was a test around uh, marketing to uh, marketing to applicants to get them to and you know get to enrollment. And we did a really complicated, this is a large education system, did a really complicated holdout strategy there where we said, okay, these 30% of applicants, and there was a, a large volume here, uh, these 30% of applicants are not going to see this display in Facebook and social uh, advertising, and these 70% are. And we, 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 it, that could be 50, 50, that could be 80, 20. We chose 70, 30 in this scenario. We tracked that over time. And we saw that the folks that saw the advertising had a much, much higher, I forget the actual percentage. We have a white paper and case study on it on our website, but 60%, uh, 60%, 60 more likelihood to enroll. Now imagine if you could get 60% more of your applications to enroll. This was insane, and the budget was very, very small. So that was one of my one of my favorite tests. So much so, we we wrote a case study on it. Uh, another one. In all marketing, there's laws of diminishing return. How much you spend and how much you get. And one of the things we like to test is how much can we spend. So we may take one day, and spend more, right? Or or one week, or front load a a month, and play with the different um, aspects of. Because we get the question all the time, how much can I spend and what am I going to get from it? And unless you have a crystal ball, there's no way to know. So we can actually, in a very controlled environment, start to test and flex in those different areas to understand that diminishing return. I, I think, uh, you know, from the creative perspective, the user generated content piece um, of, of things that we've been working with um, some of our institutions on. Um, has been working really, really well. <clears throat> there, there were early questions about like, you know, in e-commerce, 
everything's user generated content, right? Everything you see on Facebook now is somebody talking about a product. Um, and, and so leveraging that in the education space has been very powerful. So that has been really fun to test. And the other thing is testing, you know, Jeff mentioned the, the hero image, but testing against audience values. What is your audience value and asking a big question like that. And then in everything you do, like run a specific test to, are they more interested in what their life is going to look like once they leave our institution? Or are they more interested in what they're going to be experiencing while they're at our institution? And can you, can you create multiple tests to answer those bigger questions? Those are two that I have been uh, particularly happy with. And it's different institution by institution by program. They're different. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it's really interesting. It, it, and that's one of the reasons why I feel like, you know, a good program is, is always running, right? And you take something as simple as landing pages across different programs, different institutions that run in different geographies. And then you take, you know, different channels and different, you know, keywords on a, on a or search will bring folks to a different landing page, you know, and you have a CTA that worked in your first 10 campaigns really well, but you test in the 11th and it's, it's down just because that customer set, that segment doesn't respond as well. So you got to test your way in and, you know, you build out, you know, a hierarchy and a, a matrix of different landing pages for different programs that run in different geographies and the, the complexity, which takes us a little back to our, our earlier conversation around tracking and, and organization um, can get, um, it can get really intense. Right. But um because of the, the the dynamism of what we do in marketing today and certainly in an educational context with the large institutional inventories and online covering not just the country but the world and the different types of uh diverse mix of students we bring in it just it calls for a really robust testing program across the board so it's the work is never done uh, i guess never uh, last thing <laughs> last thing i want to touch on real quick tie it all together um you know we've talked about a lot um let's just take a specific use case or a specific example uh and, and i love earlier we talked about the, the smartest person in the room or you know maybe a traditional way of looking at things there's always a lot of bias or prejudice around you know traditional media tv uh, if we look at something that's changed over the last 10 years, right, since you guys have been in existence, you know, streaming and, and different streaming options and cable and, you know, some markets with smaller schools, you probably still get a lot of network viewership. Others, you have very highly targeted options available on OTT with certain levels of population density. So talk to me about, let's just say, for example, you've got a client and they've had a heavy legacy net network TV investment. They want to explore OTT and YouTube. They're not really sure how to think about it. How would you start to think about that? What types of elements would you need to set up? How would you establish that test to power their growth as they're thinking about switching, switching channels from a, you know, call it a network legacy TV investment into the world of streaming and OTT? So it's interesting. So we, we are actually running an active test around this right now for a client, Jason. And, you know, Patterson mentioned earlier uh, how rapidly things are changing. And if you really, if you look at streaming television, that is so true over the past two years with the pandemic. My dad, who was 85, uh, never watched anything on a streaming service and now has every streaming service. Um, and that's changed just over the past year and a half. And so behavior has changed so fundamentally. And, and our gut instinct is to say, oh, wow, well, we got to get into digital, right? We got we to move stuff to digital. So, you know, when we're setting these things up, it starts with the why, the context for why do you want to explore digital, for instance. Um, so we kind of know, again, that's the reaction that, you know, hey, we, we do need to be moving more of this to digital. But it, if you firmly believe something, you want to use that context to create those hypotheses that we talked about. In the case of this test in particular, we had a client asking that question, right? How much more do we want to shift into OTT? Where should we be shifting? And so, you know, we basically established a test plan around this where we took um, specific uh, experiment campuses uh, and we took control campuses and we used certain criteria to pick those campuses. And so those campuses would be those would be things like uh, the market size, the types of programs that are being offered, um, the, the student demographic population there. We tried to make them as like as we as alike as we possibly could. Um, and we try to make the controls as alike to those test campuses as we possibly could. And when we think about these things, you have to think about other variables too, right? You have to be asking the questions of the people on the ground who know their campuses. Like, you know, what might happen here that could influence this? Well, there is one campus in particular for this test where they're opening a brand new location. 
And so we had initially picked that campus, but then we dug in a little bit deeper and found out, well, they're moving locations and there's going to be a big PR push. And so that's going to throw off, that's a variable that's going to be introduced in the middle of this test that we need to account for. We can't use that campus, right? Or we shouldn't use it. Um, and so basically what we do is we say, okay, our test is going to be that we're going to shift 100% of our traditional budget from, from broadcast uh, to OTT. Um, we believe that it would not negatively impact um, the performance. And that was enough for us, right? Because we don't necessarily think that this battle of broadcast versus OTT is a zero sum game right now, because there are, there is such an overlap of people who are doing both still. Um, so we believe that, you know, if we can gain efficiency by moving to digital for us and for our client partner, um, that it's okay if that performance just doesn't take a hit, uh, because of the efficiency and the trackability, which we know is much better in digital. And so we're shifting that budget in those test campuses. We have our controls in place um, and we have our key. We basically build a test plan to say, OK, here's our hypothesis. Here is our testing sites. Here is our budget. Here is our duration. And here are our key uh, performance indicators that we're tracking uh, at the end of this. And we know we can track um, to make sure we're doing this right. Something that um, Brad, Brad hit the nail on the head there with with how we're approaching it, something that I would uh, caution people um, when they're doing this kind of test is when you pick that date, uh, you, you draw the line in the sand, the date uh, for this instance, it's a three month test, right? Monitor the results that you're getting, but don't stop the train. Um, the, the worst thing you can do is test it for two weeks, decide something's going on with my performance. We need to pull out and we're never going to do this again, right? You haven't really given it an opportunity to get its legs underneath it. Um, and to do everything that you hypothesize it would do based on the test that everybody, or the date, excuse me, that everybody agreed on. So one thing um, that I would encourage, and, and that's assuming that like it doesn't literally blow up and literally everything is, is, is terrible and on fire, but I would caution people to be overly reactionary. And it's very easy to do that, especially when you have very tight budgets with razor thin margins on your CPLs and razor thin margins on your enrollment goals, right? But when we, we talked about the importance of separating out a test budget because you don't want right. the money that you're spending on this thing you were not 100% confident on to be tied to your goals. Because if a client says, you don't have a test budget, but I'm really interested in testing this thing that we don't have any solid information about, I would say, we shouldn't test that. We should really work on hitting the, the maximizing the things that we know are going to get us the lead volume and the enrollment volume we need. So it, br it brings it back to that culture of being accepting the possibility uh, of, of losing and failing or starting to lose and then it gaining traction. And then, you know, you might lose out on month three. Yes, the first two months were worse than before, but month three, that was that was firing on all cylinders. And if we kept it going, that's likely to continue. Especially true of things like OTT, right, where you're impacting organic and behavior in, in, in an organic way. And so you have to make sure you have those leading indicators, the things that you're going to be watching early to give you an idea that this is going to be successful rather than we're going to we're going to close our eyes for three months and then we're going to wake up and look at Google <laughs> Analytics and say, oh, no, what have we done? Oh, no. Uh, the other the, the other important call out is that creative is the same. Right. Mm -hmm. So in, in both both broadcast and the OTT, same creative. You can't you can't do you know, I think everybody everybody knows that, but um, you can't you can't use two different sets of creative. Yeah, something just to, just to put a fine uh, period on this. Uh, we always have success metrics. Everybody has a success metric for a test, but you should also, especially for these really big tests, you should have a failure metric as well. So what is the threshold I'm willing to accept before I need to truly pull, pull the plug? And what's the timeline for that? And that's why you have the pivot or persevere meetings. It's not just for that three month touch base. You also have a pivot and persevere at month one and month two. So you can say checking in here, it is not performing, you know, hopefully it's, you know, doing gangbusters, but if it's not, it's not performing as well as we thought, but it has not hit that threshold for failure. So we're recommending continuing the test, right? So just if you set those expectations early, everybody's going to be on the same page and it's going to make decision making so much easier throughout the test. Yeah, and, and the last thing I'll say there, Jason, if you have, you know, sometimes sometimes we're talking about big budgets and we're talking about big impact and, you know, missing a, a few students in your start could be a big difference. Uh, and, you know, some of the things that we're talking about are fairly radical and I'm sure it could be scary to say, I'm going to take all of my TV budget and put it in OTT. That's absolutely not what we're saying, right? We're saying test it and make sure that it works first 
and you can start with smaller budgets. You can start with a 10%, 20%, like I said. And if it is such a critical part of what you're doing today, doing a 50-50 might be way too risky of a, of a, of a testing strategy. So when we think about AB, and this is a mistake I see uh, a lot, we think 50-50 always. It doesn't need to be 50-50. We can do some different things. We can use 10% of it and go explore. That's that that what we were talking about at the beginning of this, which is really just setting aside some of that budget, any portion of it for that exploration of what might be next. Yeah. I mean, a 50-50, that's no longer a test. That's a, it has to work. <laughs> yeah, work. right? You may be talking to somebody else <laughs> next month. Uh, so... Uh, the ultimate accountability if that one doesn't work. Um, hey, man, where did the hour go, guys? I appreciate it. You guys, this was amazing. So certainly encourage everyone on the webinar, uh, check out the recording and some other uh, webinars on our YouTube page at Lead Squared. Check out Level.Agency, fantastic blog, Test, Learn, Grow podcast. You guys got anything else going on? You guys, any conferences or Anything uh, we'll, we'll be at, we'll be at, uh, you know, some of the education conferences, CQ, Abhess, we'll be at LeedsCon. Uh, you know, we're really excited to roll out uh, some of our really advanced AI and ML stuff this year. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. But other than that, just listen to our podcast. We, we really enjoy doing it, putting it out. And, uh, you know, we, we appreciate the loyal followers like you, Jason, that I know you listen to it every week. So um, yep. Jason, thank you. you. This was awesome. Uh, yeah. And, and we, we, the fastest 56 minutes I've had all day. So I Jason, I'll be playing the uh, Yak Factory in Schenectady yeah. uh, on <laughs> March 3rd. I'm going to start searching for some other videos on YouTube, not just the Lead Square channel, but uh, Brad old stand-up videos. You never know what's out there. Man. All right, it was guys. all in VHS then, Jason. It was all VHS. Right. <laughs> I was going to say, it may have been before YouTube, but I wasn't going to go there, but you went there. All right, guys, appreciate it. And thanks to everyone for attending. And uh, check out our next webinar coming up soon. Love Thank it. you all. Thanks so Thanks much, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.